Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today on this very special Master Guru Live. My name is Sue Lee and I'm the head of growth at Guru. I'm here today with Kyung Han, who is a startup advisor, investor, and consultant for corporate innovation groups. In his startup advisor investor role, he focuses on the healthcare, life sciences, and education verticals, and the analytics and social media horizontals. Not only that, I'm really proud to say that he is also an advisor for Guru. Kyung, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Good. It's nice to see you, Sue, and hello to everyone out there. Great. Um, I guess we'll start off with our first question. Could you please tell us about some of the highlights of your career and what you've done for various companies? I'm really excited to hear about them. Yeah, so um, I've had a very rich career, uh, Sue, and everyone out there. Um, after college, I started out as a semiconductor engineer at Mitsubishi, and that really speaks to a lot of my interest in technology and kind of the STEM related um, topics. Um, so that was was wonderful. I ended up working for a great company um, and I was able to not only um, do a lot in terms of semiconductor design and test, but I also got to travel. I lived in Japan for about a half a year um, and I also did some really interesting work with some of my company's uh, partners, so Mitsubishi Partners, with uh, they did partner with the Microelectronic Center of North Carolina. So I got to spend about half a year at their site in Research right. Triangle Park. Um, so that was kind of a really great first experience. And then I left Mitsubishi, went to business school. After business school, I worked for a management consulting firm for about five years. Um, that in itself was wonderful. I got to travel the world, work with great clients, and more importantly, great colleagues at Booz Allen. Um, it really taught me so much about the speed at which business really uh, operates, but also um, how you form analytics to help kind of develop a solution for a particular client problem or client issue. Um, I worked on that. I worked at Booz Allen as a consultant for about five years. And then I left and ended up uh, going to work for one of Booz Allen's clients, um, mm -hmm. MIT, in kind of the digital learning space. And that really kind of started my whole interest and in kind of my whole um, enthusiasm around education and educational technology. So I helped launch one of MIT's first uh, digital learning projects called Open Courseware. And what I really liked about that was, I, when I look back upon that whole experience, um, that to me started the whole um, wave around uh, MOOCs or um, massively open online courses. Um, so that's somewhat you see today in other companies such as Coursera. But uh, it was a great experience for me again. Um, MIT is a really interesting, unique environment. Um, and I lived up in Boston for those two years. And then shortly after that, I started my own company. It initially started uh, out as a research company, but we moved quickly into um, media services. And uh, we were very fortunate to uh, start working on social media in its earliest stages. Um, I wow. helped grow the company mm -hmm. for about seven years. Uh, we have eventually did some other things as well besides research and media services. And then we exited, uh, the founders and I exited. Uh, we sold to uh, a larger business process outs outsourcing company called Genpact in 2011. I ended up working there for about five years in the whole field of analytics consulting. And then I decided I wanted to do something different. So as you noted, Sue, um, I started looking uh, into becoming an angel investor and working very closely with startups. And just recently in the last year, um, I was very fortunate to reconnect with one of my former colleagues at Booz Allen, who's now uh, the chief innovation officer at Deloitte. And he asked me if I wanted to work on a few projects there. So for the past year, I've been working with him and his group on some very interesting topics such as artificial intelligence and uh, new growth strategies for Deloitte. So it's it's been a really, wonderful career for me thus far. And I've had um, a lot of enjoyment out of it, as well as I've learned a great deal. 
Amazing. And I think that shows a lot in terms of all the different sort of industries and companies and all the different sort of areas that you've been able to touch upon. Um, and I know that you mentioned that you had graduated and focused on electrical and electronic engineering and then decided to get your MBA. So how do you think your knowledge of electrical engineering sort of helped you move towards the business world? Yeah, so I, I think when I first started doing engineering, I really wanted to apply everything I learned in college to some sort of field or some sort of career. Um, but engineering, as you might guess, and as everyone out there knows, it is very analytics driven. Um, so you have to analyze based on certain constraints, how you want to design a chip, how you want to make that chip as space efficient as possible, but also you have a, a number of constraints. And I, I like that whole aspect of how you apply analytics, but maybe, um, as I kind of grew um, in my career at Mitsubishi, I wanted to apply it to more of a business field. And I thought management consulting was kind of the perfect melding of that. It's kind of business issues, but with a lot of analytics um, dr driving some of the results. So that in itself was a great application of where everything I learned in school around electrical engineering and everything I saw and experienced at Mitsubishi but really applying it to like business settings. So you may not have to know everything about semiconductor design, mm -hmm. but you could definitely apply some of the key concepts around it to some business, uh, business problems and some business issues. So it was a great kind of um, marriage between some of the things I learned early in my career to some of the more business oriented things, which I was actually becoming much more interested in uh, further along in my career. Great. Um, with that in mind, how do you think OpenCourseWare um, paved the way for other educational technology companies that you worked on? Yeah, so I, I, as I mentioned, I think it was one of the pioneers around digital learning. Um, I think mm -hmm. there were a number of other companies that were coming out and forming um, around that time. But the difference was um, they were all for-profit companies, um, mm -hmm. and MIT went against that whole notion of trying to do something for profit because they they wanted to look at it from the greater good globally um, and i think that really provided let's say a blueprint for a number of other companies that are really um, really powerful today like coursera and these uh, online learning courses to kind of learn from what mit was doing around its open courseware program and applying it to their own companies but also doing it in a much more kind of uh, experienced way in seeing how it would work in a for-profit kind of world at that time versus when it was tried, when other companies tried to do it for profit before and it didn't work. So I think MIT taught a lot about, you know, what types of materials might be the most used in an online environment. And I think that really kind of paved the way for some of these other companies to, to do kind of online and remote learning. And as Everyone knows nowadays with the whole pandemic, remote and online learning is getting even more tested. So I think we'll continue to learn about what really works in this environment and what may need to kind of uh, require additional tweaking and improvement. Got it. And do you think, what do you think about the future in terms of educational technology? What are some of the things that may need tweaking or what do you think are gonna be some of the guiding forces in the coming months to a year? Well, I, I think learning and education are, are continually going to evolve and we'll learn a lot from what's going on today uh, with regard to the virus. Um, I've heard anecdotally a lot of stories about how parents and educators are seeing what works and trying to really kind of understand how do you really foster learning when you're not physically in front of the person. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of new things that are going to be occurring that will help foster that even more. One thing that, to answer your question, Sue, one thing I'm really excited about is um, augmented reality and virtual reality. I think that COVID and the virus in itself is gonna help augmented and virtual reality really become a stronger factor in learning. And if we can kind of get some of the real sophisticated nuances around physical learning embedded in augmented reality and virtual reality, 
I think that will be quite, uh, quite interesting and quite compelling for the future of learning. So I think that's one area I'm really excited to see what's going to happen. Um, I think another thing is some of the things that Guru is already doing, applying some of these real in-depth analytics and technological techniques to understand different styles of learning and personalized learning. So I think those things are obviously well on their way and they're going to continue to get even better. I'm imagining students all wearing those like goggles and then actually envisioning themselves in like a classroom or something for like AR or VR. That yeah. seems weird, but I feel like we're not too far off. I 100% I, I agree. I think, um, you know, one of the things that we're seeing with COVID, it, it accelerates kind of some of the progression around technologies like AR and VR. And hopefully a lot of the things that are, are a little bit problematic with AR and VR today will get resolved by continual testing and by people providing good feedback. And so maybe um, at some point, we won't have to all be wearing headsets and things like that. It will be as seamless as just finding kind of images that kind of really simulate the classroom environment without maybe some of the, what I might call the bougie equipment that people have to <laughs> Where so hopefully even the hardware stuff will yeah. uh, continue to get advanced. Yeah, it's an exciting time, although very uncertain. Yeah. And I, I'm, it's very hard not to talk about COVID right now. But I think, what do you sort of see with the uncertainty over higher education right now? How do you think both undergraduate college degrees and graduate degrees may change in the future, especially with hybrid learning, work or completely online learning? How do you think that's going to change? Well. I, you know, I've heard so many things about how COVID has maybe disrupted the whole higher education system and learning system. Um, and we also, when I was working at OpenCourseWare at MIT, we also got this question quite a bit because if MIT is releasing all their course content on the web for free, is that actually going to somewhat cannibalize some of the students who might be coming to MIT on campus and perhaps those students may not eventually apply to MIT because they'll get all the course content online. You know, I'm, I guess maybe I'm one of these folks who has a little bit different opinion about how COVID might affect higher education and learning in general. I think it's probably gonna reinforce kind of what the whole on-campus, on-site learning is gonna be. And it's gonna reinforce some of the great things about it. And it's also gonna provide some compliments to maybe what's not currently being provided on site. Um, I will say, Sue, that I've heard that even though remote learning is, is a great way of continuing education when people can't gather and can't um, uh, be at schools or at universities, I, I have heard quite a bit that it is not the most effective way of ensuring uh, comprehensive learning uh, because it's so hard to understand and grasp whether students without facial cues and kind of body language whether they're getting all the right kind of learnings that they need to be getting and I also believe that there's a great deal of learning just socially of how you interact with students when you're in the same classroom so I, I think that universities and schools they're gonna come out of COVID knowing what they learn from remote learning, they're gonna improve a lot of the things that are really gonna be the basis of on-campus um, physical learning. And they're gonna use some of the remote learning, distance learning, online learning to help complement and really complete a full education. So I, you know, I think the on-campus, on-site learning is gonna continue. I think there's also a social aspect that I mentioned that is vital mm -hmm. to students as they're kind of growing and maturing. And I think that's all going to get stronger and stronger as we come out of COVID. Got it. And do you think that's going to be the same thing with not only higher education, but going to school? Do you think it'll be closer? I think at least for anyone from kindergarten to high school, it's a strong focus on in-person. And sure, yeah. they'll use laptops or they'll have tablets. But how do you think that'll change? I know we were mentioning like AR and VR, but what are some other ways that you think going to school would be different? Yeah, so I think one of the great things about um, the school environment evolving and changing in this respect is um, younger students are getting exposed to technology even earlier. 
uh, because out of necessity. And I think given their comfort with it and their uh, utilization of it, I think that's going to seep back into the classroom. I think younger students, like as you mentioned, in kindergarten and in elementary school, that kind of gathering and on-site learning is, is very important. And I think as we get out of COVID, those students will go back to the classroom and they'll bring all their technolo uh, technology learnings from COVID and then that'll complete the whole uh, on-site um, learning environment and learning program. So that's gonna be something I envision to be even stronger. Um, and they're really gonna utilize technology even more at that level. And I think the social stuff will also, um, when you're that age, at least from when I was that young, it's so important to have kind of that socialization aspect. So I think that in itself will, will get even better. And technology is gonna improve some of that, but I think mm -hmm. COVID has really kind of um, had students who are of younger age to get more comfortable with technology. And I think teachers at the elementary school level will start to utilize it even more in the classroom to help their, their students. It's almost like the students already know how to use their phones and their tablets and the teachers are still trying to figure out how to use Google Classrooms right. or other software. So That's it's right. an interesting disconnect or at least a different type of learning curve for the teachers rather than the students. And I, I think you bring up a really good point about teachers and educators as well, because as educators also start to adapt to this new environment, they're also going to have to learn a lot of new skills mm -hmm. as well. Um, tutors and um, teachers, educators of all kinds will need to start to pick up some of these new skills that, that we've started to see. And then you mentioned the kind of this gap where I think younger folks are a little bit more adept at technology and uh, let's say people who are a bit older, they're a little less adept. I think it really kind of ups their ability to learn some of the technology to keep up with what students are really gonna be asking for and really wanting in the educational environment. Definitely. I think with that being said, now that you've sort of gone through everything in terms of your career, um, if you were to choose a major in college now in 2020, what do you think you would choose? Do you think it would still be electrical engineering? Do you think it would be business? Where do you think you, do you think you'd still follow the same path? I, I think I would generally still major in electrical engineering just because of my love of engineering and. Um, and STEM related topics. The only thing I might change to is I might have double majored in electrical engineering and let's say economics or business. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I had gotten a little bit more um, of that kind of combination in my kind of university um, life, I think that would have been the only thing that I would have changed. But you know, if I had to only pick one major again, I definitely would have picked electrical engineering again. Cool, great. Um, and then I think, what is one mistake in business that you grew up from the most? I know everyone makes a lot of mistakes and we always grow from them, but is there one that typically is like, that always stands out to you? Um, I mean, I think there's definitely things that I would have done differently. They, they all seem to be, it, now that I recall, they all seem to be like how I might have handled like a client situation because I had a number of clients when I was at a, a management consulting firm. And then uh, when I actually had my own company, we had a number of clients. Um, I guess the only thing I might say around that is sometimes when you're providing results or reports to clients, it's always good to ensure that you see everything from their perspective and not just your perspective. I think sometimes when you're in business, um, you kind of tend to be only one-sided about your view and your experience in getting to a certain point. And I think it's vital to have that, what I might call the 360 degree view. And the, the same applies to education. I think when you're a student, sometimes you also have to look at other students within your classroom or within your setting to understand like how things might have evolved in a conversation or a learning experience. And the same is true for educators and teachers. Sometimes I, I think, even in my own experience, educators and teachers have, let's say, their view about how things should be taught or how people should respond. But it's always vital to have how other, 
the other side of it might think about certain things. So I guess to answer your question, you know, I, I think having kind of that greater holistic view about different perspectives, that's probably the, some of the things I might attribute to what I, I might do differently and kind of things I might change when looking back at uh, certain experiences and certain projects I did. Yeah, and it's interesting you talk about different learning styles or perspectives. That's exactly what Guru tries to sort of hone That's in right. on. Every single student learns differently and each teacher teaches differently. And it's about finding that right connection, that right relationship to understand the learning styles because lecture settings might work for someone, but someone else might be more of a visual learner or doing activities. And that's all really important to just at least see the, like you said, a holistic view, 360 degree view of everyone who's involved. That's right. And I think when I was younger in high school, uh, for example, I think given that everyone's in the same classroom for a certain course, there's kind of this um, one style for all. <laughs> And it doesn't encompass what you said about how things have changed uh, for today. Everyone learns in a different way. I might learn really well in lecture style, but maybe um, other people actually learn better by actually doing experiments. Um, and I think that's a great thing about education today. There's always tools and resources and um, offerings like what Guru does that really kind of customize it to each person's learning. I don't think we're far from the days where everyone has to do it the same way. Um, and like you said, and as I mentioned, I think teachers are, are definitely know that now and they need to be able to address all types of learning styles and all types of learning approaches. So that's really wonderful about how the whole industry around education has evolved and how everything has become much more personalized. Yeah. So thank you. Um, and I think what is some of your most important values for yourself in business and in life? Well, I think the most important value to me in business and in life is integrity. Um, if I can't really stand by um, a piece of work, something I did, both in my career as well as in life, that's important for me to be able to stand by that. And I think the integrity value is, is, is vital. Um, and that's not something I only emphasize about myself, but it's I try to emphasize around everyone who works with me. So I, I like to see that in colleagues, I like to see that in clients, and I like to see that, of course, in our partners in business. And then, of course, everyone you uh, happen to socialize with your friends, your family. You, I want to see everyone have um, a real focus around integrity. So that's the one value that is, is extremely important to me so that you can proudly and accurately and um, uh, convey anything in terms of how you do work or how you conduct yourself in real life. So that, that's probably the one thing that I, I look for always in other people and of course in myself. Got it. Yeah, sounds like a very good North Star to have in terms of just always following something in one path. Yeah. Um, I guess if you could have invested in one startup company 20 years ago, what would it have been? What would have been that one thing that you put all your chips into 20 years ago if you had all the knowledge that you had right now? Yeah, no. So um, I think this is a really funny question for me because when I was um, working, um, let's see, this was kind of in the mid nineties. Um, a friend of mine at the consulting firm, Booz Allen, she ended up going to Google and Google at the time was just starting <laughs> out. Um, and I had heard some stuff about Google. Um, and I definitely, people had told me about how great the search engine was. And at the time there were a number of other search engines. So it's no longer, it wasn't kind of the, I guess monopoly that Google has now. There was like mm -hmm. Yahoo did searching and there was a number of other search engines. Like but Ask Jeeves or something like that yeah, too. Yeah, <laughs> Vista and I think there was quite a few others. But when I heard she was going to Google, um, I remember thinking, wow, that's really bold. And maybe I should do something around, mm -hmm. around that or kind of invest in something like that. So I guess, if I had to do it all over again, and if I had the chance to invest in Google, either if even if 
I had the money to invest in Google or invest my own time and become an employee in Google, I definitely would have done that. Now I, I hear <laughs> she, I think she ended up being like one of the first 50 employees at Google or wow. something like that. Yeah. So she's, she's doing quite well and she's quite <laughs> happy. And, and as you might guess, so that's probably the one company I might kind of take another look at, <laughs> maybe do something a bit more bold. But, you know, I think it's funny. Um, doing things that are in business are kind of a balance between making sure you've done all the kind of like analysis and due diligence, but also relying on instincts and ensuring that your instincts tell you a little bit that this might be a good bet. So it's hard to balance that thing, uh, th those two often. Sometimes your, mm. your mind kind of takes more of the decision. And sometimes your, for lack of a better term, your heart representing your instinct takes more of the decision. But you've got to find that really good balance, not only in business, but also in life. Mm -hmm. And I know you're talking about sort of heart and work and all that in terms of balance. How do you sort of maintain a work-life balance um, socially and also business? What do you sort of do to sort of, or what are you doing right now um, during quarantine? Well, so I'm, you know, I'm actually staying with family right now. So I'm getting to see my mom quite a bit. I, um, I live in New York, but I grew up in the South. So it's been great to be here and spend time with her and getting to do a lot of things that you normally wouldn't be doing because um, sometimes my New York life takes over and I tend to focus a lot on what I'm doing there and then I don't get to spend as much time. But this has been a great relief for me because we are doing a lot of fun things um, even in spite of kind of quarantining a great deal. Um, but we get to spend a lot of quality time as I might guess a lot of families are doing just because there's not a lot of options available outside of the home. So that in itself is, is, is a great enjoyment for me. Um, I am taking a few online courses that really enhance what I'm doing at work and that I've always had a specific interest in. So I'm, I'm trying to learn how to code a little bit oh. more. Yeah. So those are kind of some of the things I'm looking into. Um, and just really getting back to certain things that most everyone neglects kind of during the normal life outside of the virus. So getting back to kind of a more healthy um, kind of lifestyle, exercising a bit more, um, and really dedicating myself more to things that I've always kind of wanted to do but never had a real chance to do. So reading more and trying to rest more and meditate more and doing those kind of things. Nice. And I think we have time for one last question. And a lot of our viewers are typically middle school and high school students. Um, I guess for students trying to continue their studies during all of this, whether it's the uncertainty of if their schools are gonna be open or what they're going to do in the next four years, do you have any advice for them? Yeah, I do. Um, I think back to what we were talking about personalized learning, everyone has their own different way of learning. And a, a lot of it might be constrained by what's happening in the world today and, and the virus. But don't let that limit you to what you can do. Um, if you have certain areas like I'm doing now that I've always had an interest in, start researching them online. There's always great resources and content online, but don't let it stop there. Reach out to people, um, develop relationships. You know, the, the one thing I like about, um, being somewhat constrained about this is it really allows people to be creative and that can definitely apply to the education and people's own learning. So let's say I had a specific interest in Python, the coding language, and I started doing uh, maybe a few exercises, but start conversing with people online, getting their experiences, talking with them, discussing different applications of it. And this definitely applies to middle school students. If you've got, certain questions around some of the things you're learning online. Don't let kind of what you're learning in the or online course just dictate how you kind of bound that whole education. Reach out to other people, uh, form relationships, uh, join online groups, get uh, become more, much more creative about that. And I think you'll be limitless in terms of the additional learning that you'll have. And then, like I said, start to develop new areas that are maybe outside the curriculum of your school. 
and start to investigate those kind of things. So I think the whole aspect of creative learning and personalized learning takes on a whole new meaning in COVID because it's more in the students kind of control about what they want to do. Uh, I know when we're not in the COVID environment, you're kind of, um, you're kind of part of this, let's say eight to three or nine. I, I don't know what the school hours are <laughs> these days, but you're kind of focused more on that kind of learning setting. But now, since most students in middle school and high school are at home, you have a little bit more flexibility to kind of investigate those learning kind of avenues. So I would definitely advise you to don't be shy, just go out there and learn more, investigate new tools, uh, enlist new kind of resources like Guru and other kind of um, educational tools that are out there. And don't let learning stop because I know um, COVID is, uh, is a little bit, um, it's a factor that no one ever considered. But now that you know, we're somewhat getting used to it, try to make the most of this situation. Don't let your learning stop. Education continues on even well past graduate school. I'm still learning a great deal and I'm still looking for new resources that really personalize my learning experience. Thank you. So for all of you students out there who have nothing to do until school starts in September, I think that has um, a lot of great advice in terms of finding something to do for the next couple of weeks. So yeah, I think that wraps up our last question. But Kyung, thank you once again for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure to have the nice. opportunity to speak with you and learn more about you. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Of course. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.